I'm very happy that we're uh, that we're that we're not losing the momentum. This is a, a, a purely a passion of ours. We're we're trying to kind of see a better world for 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 our children and, and for Jews and I think for all of humanity. It really affects everyone. It's not like we. You know, if we're part of some tribe in the Amazon and we're trying to preserve that nation, it'd be great, but the impact on humanity probably won't be the same. With Jews, it's automatically impacting everything, uh, also because of their unique um, status in the system of humanity, in the network of, of humanity. Uh, then I, I really think this is an important service, and I'm happy that we have the, 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 you know, the passion to wake up and to kind of seize each new... Uh, episode with the same you know, like this is it we go we're doing it right now the problem is so big but the our part we, we don't need to immediately affect eight billion people we don't need to affect you know we talked about this uh, actually with, with David really we just need to reach a few people who are willing to to zoom out and see this big picture and And then grab hands and, and come back together and because of, of uh, the nature of this network we we'll already see good results reverberating through the system so each time we get a chance to do this I feel very hopeful at first I was feeling so overwhelmed it's like we're chopping we're, we're like you know trying to eat the whale all at once but really it, it's not that much more that needs to be done to get past just just to get get, get those you It was like early adopters over and then we'll you know it'll it'll flow through the network no it's true every every comment that I get uh, either the, you know direct you know personally or like on the Facebook or on the YouTube or even on Twitter uh, you get those comments and some people are like oh my god like everybody's got to see this and I'm like oh wow so more people are interested in seeing it this, this is good this is and, and it's good I'll tell you why not because um, we, we meet with, with a lot of people who, who do amazing work and keeping the, uh, the, uh, the, the raging anti-Semite at the gate, right? There's a lot of those, like how David uh, Lang from la- last episode was like, you know, calling them out and sending the records straight. And, and our guest today is also, you know, doing some important work on, uh, you know, kind of keeping the, the tr- what was that, Lord of the Rings too, when you have the, the, the waves of the orcs and the goblins, right? So you got to keep them at bay if you want to do something. Otherwise, you know, otherwise, The, you know we would be taken by by this uh, the, the this rising tide so th- these people are doing amazing work and we're really blessed to have them here kind of take time away and talk about this how do we fo- focus on what we need to do as Jews because our, our destiny in this world is not to fight the anti-semites I don't I don't believe it I, I don't buy it for a moment I I I, I think everybody feels the pressure anti-semitism puts on you and that pressure is important we touched on it last week and I well, maybe we'll touch on it today as well that pressure is important we can use it as a, as a tool as an instrument but that's not where our destiny lies it's not to I gotta go out and fight and die in the trenches it's not World War one there's actually something I think worthwhile attaining if we focus on what can we do between us this is really the place where we have to The most control the highest chances of success even though the odds are a bit scary but still you know the, the quantity of people involved is, is tiny we, we can really make an impact so every time we have someone who is willing to come here and talk about what they're doing but also about that side of it I'm very uh, excited this guess may be a little closer to your heart because you, you, you know you have a, a kid in college right so so I yeah. Everything that happens in that world is already suddenly very close, right? It's, let's, let's, let's call our, our guest and uh, maybe he'll shed some light about uh, what he did. The so-called pro-Palestinian cause, which is again just shorthand for the anti-Israel cause, has become embedded with these progressive principles that have become dominant on college campuses in a way that we haven't seen before. A student in Princeton and his, he was the former president of the pro-Israel group, the Tigers for Israel. Then you have this entire ecosystem that's working against Israel. Do the Princeton University kids not realize like they're on Native American lands? You have suddenly this, this very uh, explosive concoction happening on college campuses. The public is becoming increasingly aware of the dangers of wokeism and he uh, also last year defeated the BDS on campus and it's all just about bashing Israel Jared please 
The Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? It's great to be here. Thank yeah. you both for having me. Maybe you can tell us about your experience on campus. Like, what, what's it like these days? Because I, I don't know, it's been many years for me since I've been on campus. Uh, what's, what's, what's going on there? Sure. So, you know, I can provide you some insight into my own background, and maybe that can be um, kind of a window into talking about these phenomena more broadly. Um, when I got to Princeton, I, didn't, I did not really anticipate being, you know, um, kind of at, at, at the, the forward end of the effort of fighting against anti-Zionism anti and anti-Semitism. But I think by circumstance, I, I got placed into that position because, um, you know, and this is probably the first thing that I think we should be talking about is that it's, it's very difficult to uh, incentivize students to be at the forefront of this fight. There are so many forces that we're seeing transpiring on college campuses that are pushing students and pushing Jewish students and even very well-intentioned uh, pro-Israel voices away from this fight. The fact is that it's so difficult today to get people to want to put themselves out there and at least how I see it, defy the odds um, and you know, fight against BDS and fight against other forces of evil and anti-Semitism on college campuses. Um, and so that's kind of the background that I bring in terms of my actual experience in the BDS. Um, I was, again, put in a position where, you know, kind of by circumstance, I became the leader of the pro-Israel group at Princeton Tigers for Israel. We had a BDS campaign kind of brewing on the horizon. There was, there were some murmurs of something happening in the spring when I would still be president. This was last year in early 2022. And finally, um, you know, after after a protest in front of our Hillel, um, the president of the uh, anti-Israel group on campus, the purportedly pro-Palestinian group, which I think is a false title because really it's just there um, you know, to the detriment of Jewish and pro-Israel students, but they put forward a BDS uh, resolution. It was voted through the student government, which means that it became a referendum to be voted on via a plebiscite of the entire student population. And, you know, for months and months and months, as the spearhead of the anti-BDS effort, um, you know, we fought tooth and nail to make sure this thing would not win. But, but hold on, but, just to make, make it clear to yeah. people who are listening, what is actually happening? What is the BDS doing on campus? Some people, sure. I'm sure, know about it. Some people are like, what is that? Like, what, 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 so what? So they have some political agenda. Who cares? Like, yeah. this is, th thank, you, thank you for asking about this. I think it's good to provide some context to this. So, BDS, which is the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, um, is a movement that purports to be supporting, you know, the liberation or the rights of Palestinians. And it's it's this organization that finds its way into different college campuses that proposes referenda or resolutions to be voted on by students to try to, uh, you know, get the school to advise the school to divest from Israeli companies and corporations with dealings in Israel. And so it might seem kind of innocuous on the surface, you know, oh, it's just kind of a, a business or transactional type of thing. But really what, what BDS is at its core is it's an effort to try to turn the dial and to change the public opinion against Israel by starting at the incubator of the future generation of leaders, namely America's colleges and universities. Right. And so really that's, what, that's essentially what BDS is. It is kind of the, the start of this chain reaction or this domino effect of trying to turn the public against the state of Israel. Jared, you said that yeah, go ahead. you said that it was uh, difficult to get students to uh, be involved in this. Why? Well, the reason why is because um, you know, first of all, I think that the so the the so-called pro-Palestinian cause, which is again just you know another shorthand for the anti-Israel cause, it's become embedded with these progressive principles that have become dominant uh, on college campuses in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, you know, progressivism was always was always a potent force on college campuses in the U.S., but today it's at a level that we haven't seen, and it's pretty much universal. And so when you have a, a, a predominant progressive culture among students that advises people against, you know, the so-called occupation or the imperialist uh, leanings of the Israeli government, then you have this entire ecosystem that's working against Israel, that's working against Jewish students. And how I see it is that you have that coupled with the fact that it's become really hard for, I think, a lot of Jewish institutions and Jewish leaders on campus 
to assert themselves against this. And I think at least the way that I see it is that it creates a perfect storm that makes it really, really difficult for students to, to fight uh, these negative forces. Jared, if you, you, if you, uh, you can control the, uh, uh, the mass is pretty easy with disinformation, but yeah. on a college campus, do the Princeton University kids not realize like they're on Native American lands? You know, when they, they, they like don't don't the, don't the Nat don't the Princeton University kids realize like all America, the, the United States is you know colonialized and all you know, and, and there's plenty of other places where there's problems. Do they not yeah. make the discernment between Israel and other places? Yeah. So the thing is that um, I think that speaks to one of the other kind of key understandings of this whole movement, which is that it's rooted purely in emotion. And there's very little logic and reason actually driving it. So yeah, of course you're right, that if these progressives were actually true to what they what they believe, you know, they would be talking about, you know, that they themselves are stealing this land. Now, it's not something that I'm gonna talk about because I, 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 I think, you know, that whole argument is bogus. You can go back and, you know, uh, you know different groups have, have taken this land and previously occupied this land or whatever, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, the way that this stuff works is that they're willing to bypass any semblance of reason or logic. And, and it's all just about bashing Israel. And they've been, they've been conditioned to believe this. And so it's important to understand, again, that, you know, you're trying to present them with a logical argument and, and, and make them understand that there are real fallacies in the way that they're presenting these things. But it's purely pathos. It's purely driven by emotion, and that's just the way that okay. it is. Okay. So how do you how do you counter something like that? That's that's so emotional. Um, yeah. Because especially on college campuses, you would you'd think some people would think, well, you know, here are the facts, and why don't you you know decide for yourself and use your noodle and all of that? But it's not what's happening. It's as you said, it's a very emotional thing. Uh, a lot. I think there's a lot of. I think if people look, there's a ton of clips. Uh, uh, people going out and, and calling out a lot of misinformation and fake information, all that. And it's almost like people are unhinged. It's like, what? I, I'm not interested. Yeah, the if you get into... Uh... The facts are, are a tool by the hand of the oppressor, right? That's like the, the, the tagline of... Uh, yeah. You know, you, the... With, with, with um, anxiety and stress, when, when a person is and worked up emotionally, um, we're not using our... our you know, frontal cortex. So when we're when we're anxious and stressed and passionate, we're we're not using critical thinking at all. That's why it's impossible to reason with someone when you're having like a heated, angry argument with them. Everybody just reverts to um, this primal emotional response. So you can have the smartest logical answers, but you're not going to budge a person at all. So yeah. what do you do? Well, it's a, few, there, 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 it's a few things. And I think, you know, this is when you get down into the weeds of this, it's really hard because you realize just how pervasive this whole mentality is. But I think the first is that, you know, the, the university has been transformed from its original intent, which was to be a place of truth seeking, of trying to find out the, the truth about the world into a place where, you know, um, some of, you know, you know, emotions are coddled relentlessly, right? And a lot of them are, you know, a lot of these things are very unproductive for students. So schools will feed into these narratives and into these dialogues that are causing people to sink emotionally. Um, and, you know, you talk about like the whole like mental health crisis and all this stuff, it's all intimately related because when people feel like they are, that they are detached emotionally and they're, they're, they're looking for something to fill that void. And I think that this emotional, um, attachment to you know the anti-israel cause and standing up for the oppressed for the brown palestinian blah 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 it's been a way for people to feel like they have a sense of attachment again so these things are all related um but again it's hard the same reason why so, people used to join yeah. gangs or still join gangs yeah you know everyone's looking for everyone's looking for a sense of attachment and i think that you know um that's a that's like a fundamental issue with the university these days but really you know so there's an issue there, right? But like, it's also incumbent upon the Jewish community to be able to assert itself and to speak loudly about kind of how we're able to remedy some of these issues that students are having. Because I feel like there is an interconnectedness between kind of the um, the lack of emotional connection that these students have and kind of the kind of the sinking feeling that they're having with all I these just things that are being thrown at them. And, I just and, solved and it for you. in Israel. 
You know, on college campuses, they always have like Shabbatones. You get like a Friday night dinner with everyone. Yeah. You need to you need to be the most loving, warm organization on campus, which like makes great dinners, brings in, you know, I don't know, does something great and it's open. And then when that person's out there standing saying Jews are this, Jews are this, like, oh, no, I just was with that guy last night for dinner. or Oh, that guy just had made this great. You guys need to become the you know, emotionally nurture everybody and then they'll, nobody can say anything against you. I agree, but it also depends on, it's important to understand that it has to be based on values, right? So like my hello, which I don't participate in anymore for various reasons, but you know, they'll have like these like, you know, mental health events or whatever. And like, you know, the, the idea of nurturing people's sense of emotional security is, is good and it's important, but it also has to be rooted in, in, a, in a, a firm sense of what values you actually believe in. And so, you know, having these places for, for people to, to vent and to connect on an emotional level, there has to be some sort of value attached to that or, or else it's just vanity. It doesn't really mean anything. And so okay. I think emotion so and, and value? value have to be interconnected in that way. Agree. So what's the value that we need to promote? Well, I think that we need to promote a more positive vision of, of you know, what Israel and Judaism ultimately represent. I think the fact is, is that we're, you know, Universities, by and large, are backpedaling when they're addressing these issues. You know, let's say you know you, you have like at Princeton, you know, you'll have like the the anti-Israel group protesting in front of the Hillel, and our go-to reaction is, you know, well, if you look at Israel's policy, you know, they're actually not doing this, and it's not quite this, and we're actually we're actually not as bad as you guys say that we are. Don't don't you know don't 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 be worried about us. You know, we're not, we're not really that bad, and that's the wrong reaction. You know, we have to be proactive about this. We have to say, you know what, Israel is. Not only is Israel not bad, Israel is wonderful, right? And 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 Judaism as a religion and Israel as a state for the Jewish people, they bring so much warmth and positivity into the world. And that's the way that we have to communicate our values because no one likes watching somebody who's, you know, who's on his heels and is trying to backtrack and is kind of being pushed out of the pushed out of the debating arena. And I think that's kind of where a lot of our Jewish communities at these universities are today. Do do you think um I, I find it it's an interesting uh, I, feel, I feel like we're at an interesting juncture on the one hand uh, Judaism Jews as a phenomena is is very strange right so it's a it's a real paradox in nature uh, by all accounts we were supposed to disappear a long time ago and yet we we survived but it's almost like yes you will survive but you will stay the same size it's, it's not like we survived and we like we grew and no, it's like it's like the same tiny number of people survive and stay throughout history. So yeah. on the one hand, there's definitely an enduring uh, quality, uh, certain values, as you said, certain things. On the on the other hand, uh, I think you wrote about it in your in, in something that I read that you wrote uh, that there's like a sort of a need to reevaluate what it means to to be a Jew today, what it means to be to what it is to be Jewish and where do we stand and, and how not to fall here, not to fall there. And I, so the question is, what in your mind uh, did we miss, uh, miss out on, you know, in, in this pro evolutionary process uh, as a people, as a nation, what are we lacking? What did we lose along the way? What do we need to get? Or maybe we have all the answers in just a matter of reframing it. Like what, yeah. what's, where, where, where is this? Like on the one hand, so strong. On the other hand, so like uh, falling apart. What's what's going on? Yeah, so I tend to be of the latter opinion of yours. I think that we actually have a tremendous arsenal of ideas and values, and we just need to find a way to to dig into that and to bring them back to the surface. I think that, you know, I think that when you're looking at the phenomenon of anti-Semitism today, vis-a-vis anti-Zionism at college campuses, what you're seeing is something very different than the, the far right attitudes of the mid 20th century, right? You know, and I think that that's kind of at the root of how we need to diagnose and ultimately address this malady. You know, back back in the 20th century, I think you can say that kind of the prevailing thesis was, you know, okay, you had these people who very outwardly hated and tried to diminish us for who we are and made that very clear on like a, a visceral and vocal level. And now, like this form of anti-Semitism that we're seeing is, I think, trying to kind of dismantle the building blocks that have made us who we are from within, right? So it's much more insidious. 
in the way that it tries to kind of find its way into the very core of who we are, into our inner sanctum as a people, and to try to tear it down from within, all under the, the pretense of being uh, virtuous and trying I, to commit to social I, justice. I think, by the way, I'm sorry for jumping in, but I that's think fine. that's probably what, what you're describing is, uh, out of all the guests that you had, you kind of described it very well, because it's the first time that it's, uh, it's really undermining us from within. Like you, you have Jews who are actively buying into it. There were always Jews on the other side. In every anti-Semitic group, you find a Jew. It's almost uh, historically, it's like it's. Been, but this in, in this round, it's really, really, it's it's all out. It's not like okay, there was a split. We lost a few people along the way. We gained some more. We kind of everything stayed more or less the same, right? Net zero. But now you have a lot of people who are starting to doubt their own beliefs and values. Um, and be like, well, maybe this whole same thing in Hellenism also, Leo, and it's probably other situations. true. Absolutely. And, and there was a big backlash, but, but today, I think because of today's climate and the fact that it's, we're not like a small group in a small kingdom in a tiny land in, in the middle East, it's like Jews everywhere. Uh, and we kind of lost on the one hand, we, we stepped out of the, the very safe, you know, network of or, or orthodoxy of of the you know the religious background that held us. You know, like it or not, it was it was a sanctuary, right? You had the messengers taking or the shlichim taking away the, these ideas and spreading them, and everybody kind of following the same routine. There was something that uh, even on a, on a very basic level, on the, we call it on the still level, on the inanimate level, kept us together, right? Now you have a million factions. Everybody's kind of this idea. This, we're the, the era of the self, right? I'll, I'll identify yeah. as what I want to identify as. And so you're losing that. You're losing the communal aspect. Those old values, a lot of people are not aware of them. They don't know the past yeah. stories. And so it's chipping away at the very essence of, of the human inside of this equation. Is it, is it a fair assessment? Absolutely. And I think that when you look at, I think that's why, you know, perhaps he, perhaps even more critical than I've been of kind of the pro-Palestinian or I, I, again, I use that term kind of mockingly because they don't actually care about them. It's simply an anti-Israel movement, but uh, you know, even more so than I criticize them and, you know, like the BDS movement at Princeton is, is the way that I I've turned to a lot of these Jewish leaders and these Jewish organizations, because I think that that actually the root of the issue sits with them and their inability to kind of stave off these malign forces that have moved their way into our core and have tried to dismantle us from within. So, okay, so this is this is a very unique point, which uh, we do not shy away from uh, d digging into. So mm -hmm. uh, you point to the Jewish leaders and say there's some responsibility with them. Yeah. So can you open that up a little more? Sure. Yeah. So I, I want to make it very clear, you know, from the onset that you know, we need to have these, I believe we need to have these conversations, right? And they're not personal. They're not tit for tat. I'm not, I'm not looking to slander anybody's character or whatever, but it is important that, you know, we, we kind of bring these internal dynamics to the public view, because the fact is that I think that, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of the leadership that we have has their heads kind of stuck in the past and, and they're not really willing to look and assess the current situation for what it is. And I think that there are a lot of reasons for that, but I think it's important that, you know, just as the difficulties we face and the, the types of anti-Semitism that we're dealing with have evolved, it's important for us to, on one hand, look to the past, but to also um, find some sort of evolution in our way of resolving those issues. So we may not, yeah. we may not find in them the kind of leadership we need. It might not be about reforming their, their leadership style or, yeah. right, but it may be about finding uh, new leaders, new thought leaders, new new leaders with with a, with a different understanding of the problem. So let let's instead of thinking, you know, that uh, we're gonna you know, finally get a chance to sit down with the JDL and explain to them that you know suing everybody who says something bad about us is not gonna fix the problem. Uh, yeah. You should change like this. Let's actually say, okay, well, what what do the new Jewish leadership? What does the new Jewish leadership look like? I don't think anyone else is doing what we're doing and uh, yeah and that's exactly it no, nobody can comprehend what we're talking about how could there how could who would even say that anti-semites are have anything valuable to say without saying we're anti-semitic or we're self-hating Jews but there's something that everybody's missing
in this whole picture. And the reason why the solution is so close is because we're not waiting for anyone else to change. We're not waiting for the laws to be enacted. We're not waiting for a new politician to get elected. The answer is way closer than everybody thinks. Like us, uh, hit the, the bell thing on the YouTube so you can get a notification when, when a new episode is up. Well, this is the Jew function. And uh, let's get back to our guests. Let's actually say, okay, well, what, what do the new Jewish leadership, what does the new Jewish leadership look like? What do they do? What would they do, ideally? Well, I think that, you know, let, let's look, let's look, you know, CUNY has been in the news a lot. And so let's look back at kind of like the the views and the narratives that were espoused by a lot of the students back then, like 60 years ago, right? Like, you know, a lot of, a lot of these Jewish institutions were, were also bastions of, of tremendous patriotic thought. And so not only did not only did they carry their sense of Jewish pride, but they also allowed it to intermingle with their sense of Americanness and their and their love and adoration of the values that that, that conveyed. And I think that we have to kind of find a way to revive that in the current climate. I think that the fact is that the same forces that are chipping away at our very being, our very essence on college campuses, are also trying to dismantle you know, the sense of patriotism and the, the love of our country and of American values that we also see, um, you know, these, these things are interconnected. Uh, and so ultimately what I think that that means is that we have to find a way to resuscitate the classical liberal values that have been so wonderful in helping to, to alleviate our, our, our um, bad conditions as Jews and to help to bring us into a state of prosperity. Um, I think that this whole woke, progressive, illiberal, whatever you want to call it, trend that we're seeing on college campuses is, is only resolved by trying to find a way to, to, to marry our Jewish principles with our American values and our love of, the, of both the Judeo-Christian tradition, but also you know, the classical liberal tradition as well. And we have to carry all those values in our toolkit in order to actually find a way to move forward. You know, we... we my issue with a lot of the a lot of the ways in which you know some of our legacy Jewish leaders are going about things is that they think that you know by trying to engage with or even indulge these woke tendencies that they're going to find a way through. And the problem is actually that those tendencies are themselves antithetical to our being and to our prosperity at these right. universities. There's, there's, there's no question that you know p politicians they try to solve things politically, diplomatically. It's like right. they're that's their go-to thing, and uh, you know they look at things in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, supporters and enemies, and yeah. you know how do, how can I move people from this camp to that camp and, and not anger this camp? That's a very specific view of the world. Uh, maybe the question um, there's actually a lot of questions. I don't know if we'll be able to dive into all of them, but I wonder if you can if you can just theorize uh, what. Um, what 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 were the conditions that gave birth to the woke movement the way we see it now? Like why do you why do you think and and you don't even have to worry about the, the whole country just maybe on on college campus you know you have these young people coming to to study right coming to just look at that slice of of right of the population people coming from homes certain conditions at home into this. Uh, into this place called, you know, into a, a, um, uh, an academic institution, and on the way to the rest of their lives, and in it, they're, they're, they they find themselves embroiled in this uh, in this these ideas, and they they connect with them, they resonate with them emotionally. Something is happening there, and I think we had a guest here that we try to together to kind of take it apart. Why do you think that 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 whole um, mindset is even? Is, is, is it even happen? Like, how does it have so many uh, clients? Let's put it this yeah. way, right? What, what what do you think that is? Maybe that that will help yeah, us. Yeah, so, so, I mean, there. I, I'm having difficulty finding where to start, but you know, we can I think kind of place this within a few different periods of time. The first, I think, you know, being being during kind of the the counter revolutionary, excuse me, not the counter, the revolutionary efforts of the 1960s that we saw happening on college campuses. So obviously we we talk uh, you know when we look at American history we talk a lot about kind of the 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 backlash to some of these prevailing institutional trends that we saw happening among young people at college campuses you know this is the time obviously of the Vietnam War and the sexual revolution 
all these different forces that warranted some sort of backlash among students. But with that said, you know, as these students were pushing leftward and, you know, uh, forcing, you know, the, these anti-institutional and anti-war, et cetera, efforts at their respective college campuses, there was always an institutional bulwark that was being put up against that, right? So like the, a lot of administrators weren't having it, even if faculty were kind of agitating as well. A lot of the corporations, you know, they weren't, they weren't indulging in this type of stuff. And certainly the government, you know, right? Like, especially under Nixon, you know, um, a, a lot of elements of the government weren't exactly indulging these behaviors either. No, no, no. As you move as you move further into you know the the twentieth century and the late twentieth century, get to like the eighties and nineties, you know that's kind of when you know political correctness as a term starts to come about. And when you when you look at like social activism, you also see that this is around the time when uh, South African apartheid becomes kind of the cause celebre. Um, it becomes it's because it becomes kind of the focal point uh, of advocacy um, of this left wing uh, agitation that we see on college campuses. Um, it's the 1990s, I think, you know, you had that, but in terms of Jews on college campuses, I would also say that the 1990s were, you know, a time of great blossoming for Jews on college campuses. You finally had a lot of these places, you know, where the, the restrictions on Jews were, you know, had been put off for several decades. Jews were finding their way. Jewish life was really flourishing in the, in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah, it was the golden era. Definitely. Was, yeah. Um, I kind of wish, you know, I, I, I got to see it for myself because it was just a very different time. But then, you know, but then I think that slowly you started to have this distinction between these, these revolutionary impulses and the kind of institutional, um, the, the institutional bulwark. I think they started to decay and they started to fray in the, in the years and decades after that. And, you know, in the Jewish context, combined with the fact that like, the 1990s was seen as a time of, of potential peace with the Palestinians, the Oslo Accords, et cetera. And then things all, you know, which was a profit. disaster, by the way. You know, yeah, so. it was like a disaster. Yeah, it was a total disaster, of course. But like <laughs> things, things completely turned because, of course, you know, the, the Palestinians rejected rejected actual efforts at peace. But you started to see this turn happening in the, you know, at the turn of the millennium where, you know, slowly, you know, you had more faculty and more administrators starting to indulge in these behaviors. And soon enough, like there was an incentive structure that was built that was so all encompassing that by now, you know, in the in the late 2010s and the early 2020s, especially with things like, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd was a huge inflection point in this, by the way, um, as was the May 2021 uh, Sheikh Jarrah incident, as far as, you know, the Jewish, the, the Jewish kind of um, answer to this, but all these things kind of um, manifested in, in this current climate where there's virtually no distinction between the, the revolutionary forces on campus and the institutions that are supposed to provide some sort of bulwark against it. And so the fact is, like, you're talking about the sort of counterculture that used to exist in the 1960s. Well, the counterculture is now the dominant culture. Believing in DEI, believing in all this woke stuff, it doesn't make you different. It doesn't make you rebellious anymore. In fact, committing yourself to traditional principles and, and, to, a, and to a more you know, religious uh, way of life, that makes you part of the counterculture. And so when right. you have the entire system you know, getting turned on its head and committing itself to the very things that they were fighting against in the 60s, that's when you have everything, you know, everything laid bare. And that's how the woke stuff has, I think, you know, those are, those are at least like some of the reasons why the woke stuff has become so prominent these days. It, it sounds very much like a, a predictable pattern, and I'm sure yeah. we could trace that pattern. So what, what happens and, and what happens in the next stages? Because well, so I mean, far, it, each well, well, just, mentioned, just, just, it sounds... Well, just to add to Seth, uh, I don't know, have you heard of the fourth turning? I, I assume like I, I don't know, I haven't heard the term itself, but I assume I kind of understand like the, the Strauss Howe theory there. They started as like market research and then they kind of characterize this. Everything is moving in a cycle of fours right. fours and right. And every generation is moving through these cycles and then they become, they play a relative role to the other generations, right? So in yeah. one generation, you're like the, the prophet, then you become the, the rebel, then you become like, and it kind of goes through cycles and a lot of what people are saying, like, this is now the end of this is the fourth turning like the end of the cycle a full cycle it usually ends with some crisis some calamity some like if you go back to every major like you know revolution or big war they always fall on on the those chinese proverb goes uh um hard times make strong people yeah. strong people make good times good times make weak people that that kind of yeah. thing yeah yeah so also that yeah, yeah think so, about it so it seems like you know as you 
painted this story now from the mid 1900s or the the 1960s really now through today uh this seems very cyclical and very predictable and so then we should also be able to you know pull out the the the, the stay the, ahead of the curve somehow <laughs> yeah we, we should yeah. be able to like extend the the spreadsheet and see what's going to happen over on the right hand side next yeah so I, to that i would say you know I, I i agree in part i disagree in part so i agree in the sense that you know um I think like, you know, Kettery's Paribus, like with all else equal, you do have these, these, these cycles that are, that, you know, kind of, there's a, you know, there, there's a, there's an ups and downs and they kind of find their way. And so there is definitely a cycle to this in the sense that like the woke stuff is being noticed for what it is by, by, you know, a lot of Americans, you know, the woke stuff is not popular among, among most Americans, right? So like polling shows that like, even like independents and a lot of Democrats too, a lot of self-reported liberals they're not fans of this woke stuff because it, it just it's completely ahistorical. It, it it pays no tribute to the American tradition or to religion or all these other building blocks of society. And so that's one thing where I think that the the cycle is kind of continuing to go. However, and then there's another force at play, which is that, you know, just as the public is becoming increasingly aware of the dangers of wokeism, you're also seeing wokeism becoming further entrenched in our institutions. And that's the big issue, right? So like wokeism is an inherently liberal force that cuts away at, at these traditional cycles. And so when you see these, these universities and these corporations further entrench wokeism and its kind of constituent elements like DEI and ESG, um, when it further entrenches them, then you're kind of cutting away at the, at the traditional ways in which these things work. And so just as people are becoming more aware of wokeism and its dangers, like it's also becoming increasingly more difficult to actually root them out of institutions. And that's a big paradox and something that, you know, we really need to, I think, notice as a, as a collective American society and as Jews for that matter, because it, 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 it bears significantly on our own state at these places as well. So I think the question is, um, Obviously, the, these are, there, there are these big things that are, you know, we can't really control, like, not, not head on. I mean, the things are happening. We will all be a little wiser, you know, you know, 10 years from now, from now looking back. Mm -hmm. But looking at history, and, and that's why I'm, I, I think even though um, the way you kind of like describe the, you know, woke and how it's a little different, I agree. But, you know, when we're in something, it's, very, it's easy to see, you know, kind of like, it's easy to, to get confused sometimes with the, with where pieces belong. When you kind of move back, maybe you will realize that, okay, that was just a narrative that characterized something. But at the end of the day, it amounted to the same result, some sort of a, a counter action, right? Like some sort of a destruction of some old institutions, old, old way of thinking, or some, some sort of an inner desire that wanted to, to, kind, of, to kind of come forth. And I, and I, I want to I wanna focus on that because I, I feel like if we understand where people are coming from, what motivates them, uh, not the, um, you know, the political context or, or, or the story on top, but really like at the heart of a person, then it might be easier maybe uh, to, to also understand what we can do against that because precisely because as a nation, we have 4,000 years of documented history. You have a lot of facts, a lot of cycles that you know, have gone under our Right in our, in, our, in our engine, and and we can learn a lot from it, and see kind of where 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 we're going, where the world is going, the world's attitude is going. So for one thing, uh, I'll start with the end, the attitude of the world towards the Jews. That there's no surprise, there's no big surprise there. I mean, the way it manifested is it was really interesting. I don't think anyone could have like foreseen that, but to to see the Jews being uh, being the the catalyst the driving force in the development of a, of a nation to the point that it becomes the leader, uh, you know, in, in, in its world. And then to go from like the, 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 you know, the, uh, as you said, the, um, we, we were like the, the deer, uh, what's that, what's, what's that term? Um, uh, anyway, the, the, the ones that everybody yeah, liked a lot. I know what you mean. What's that? Like like deer in the headlights, or is that not? No, no, not deer in the headlights. Like the like the the the, the deer, no, like the beloved, the uh, appreciate, the one that everybody likes to likes to love. Uh, ah, forget about it. But the point is, going from these group this group of people that was right 
part of the the really the rise of this nation to to where it's at just like jews have been part of the rise of every other developed nation in the last 2000 years there's no question there's no you know it's, it's no mystery there uh and also getting to the to the top of their game in that country always getting to the really the highest positions in in the, in, in the academics in uh, economics in the um the, the ruling uh, uh the, the politics you name it and then the next stage after that for us is usually some sort of a counter reaction that doesn't end well it's usually yeah. right some sort of a back against the wall or you know on a train somewhere it's it's just not great and this i i you know even though i can't necessarily explain all these other processes and exactly how they go our part in it is usually pretty clear and so i'm asking you um as someone who's seeing the these these forces at, at play um how can we prevent that how can we what can we do what would really give us the 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 strength to avoid another i don't want to say another holocaust but you know what why not you know something as dramatic not necessarily the same manifestation in the same way okay I'm not i'm not thinking concentration camps and trains but another sort of really bad reaction from a point yeah. where you thought you were like uh you you were uh, you were you were the you know equal to everyone in on, on every level right yeah to go to the point that you're the 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 persecuted one the the one that the society shuns how do we how do we not get there all right so the jew function a lot of people ask what uh, what is this and, and who are we are we anti-semitic are we uh, self-hating Jews? I, I heard that also. I... We're like you. We're concerned citizens. But we did our research. Hours and hours and hours of research uh, into historic patterns, into uh, Jewish texts. And I mean a lot of Jewish texts uh, going all the way back to Abraham and other notable sages and Kabbalists and, and all the way into the uh, recent era. You'll be surprised how much amazing quotes exist about uh, the need for Jews to unite. So that's why we're doing this this podcast. Like us, uh, hit the, the bell thing on the YouTube so you can get a notification when a new episode is up. Uh, share, share it far and wide. You know, find something that you like. YouTube lets you cut clips. Share that clip with a loved one, with a Jewish friend, with a non-Jew who's like bothering you at work about something. And we're like, oh, that clip is exactly what I needed. Share it far and wide. Comment, comments, commenting is a great way to get a conversation going. And uh, let's get back to our guests. What would really give us the 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 strength to avoid another? I don't want to say another Holocaust, but you know what? Why not? You know, something as dramatic, not necessarily the same manifestation in the same way. Okay, I'm not I'm not thinking concentration camps and trains, but another sort of really bad reaction from a point yeah. where you thought you were like uh you you were uh, you were you were the you know equal to everyone in on, on every level right yeah to go to the point that you're the 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 persecuted one the the one that the society shuns how do we how do we not get there well m my simple answer would be shock therapy and i can kind of explain what i mean by that but i think Please. that's kind of it's kind of the way that i see it is that you know the the forces against us and against the state of Israel and and the Jewish people at large they're 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 barreling at a, a thousand miles per hour on a high speed train, and the the vanguard that we put up against that, especially you know the, within the past five ten years, has been moving at, at not nearly the same pace. And so of course you know you're not going to be able to resist those forces if you're kind of having a, a slow gradually moving machine. Uh, but the fact is, like these forces are the, these forces are are moving very swiftly, and they're and they're kind of disseminating these these values and ideas within American society that run contrary to our best interests. Uh, you know, not only as Jews, but also as industrious and very grateful members of American society. And so, I don't think that you know, I think that what we've been doing within the past ten years, especially at college campuses, especially you know, uh, you know these these legacy groups as well, you know. That have kind of seen these issues is that they're 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 trying to kind of I think spoon feed people into into kind of finding them uh, uh, an exit ramp from all this craziness happening right so like 
You know, when we see some sort of provocation, right, you know, some sort of justified Israeli action against terrorism, and then there's a huge uproar about it, you know, we, we're, 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 we're very kind of gingerly finding our way into kind of placing people into this frame of mind where, you know, okay, Israel is not as bad as it seems, right? Like, oh, Israel had to do this for X reasons, and we're really not that bad, and blah, 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 blah. But it always, it always rests upon a degree, like, like a lack of certainty on our end. For understanding, you know what what Israel's role is in the world. Why is it doing what it's doing? And it's so, such a reactive need, role instead of proactive. It's extremely reactive. And what we need to do is that we need to bolster our own confidence in 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 our own existence and the actions of the Jewish community and of the state of Israel. Right? Like we, we don't have anything that. We, what do we stand for, though? Proactive. Yeah. What What is the role of Israel in the world? You we said I mean, that, that. That's, that's the board. problem. We, we don't. We don't. We don't have. You know, Israel. The, the, Israel is a stabilizing force. It is a force for it is a force of light. It is a force for democratic ideals, for the classical liberal tradition, in an otherwise very averse region of the world. And increasingly, as we see kind of the threats that were faced uh, as as a part of the Western world, especially with even like China, right? Like China is like the the emerging threat. Israel is is playing an increasingly important role. And so, we from both, you. hold on, we we we, we yeah. agree with you. Yeah. But the issue is when you see protesters that say like queers for Palestine, right? Yeah. Like we understand where flaming gay people are safe in the Middle East. Yeah. Tel Aviv. That's yeah. the place where they're safe, right? They're not, so we get that. You know, you want to be gay? Like Tel Aviv is your place in the Middle East, not Ramallah, you know, like yeah. we understand that, but you know, you're talking very very logically, but the people that need to understand what we're talking about don't understand that. It's important that like you, you almost laugh yeah. if you see like, you know, queers yeah, for Palestine, like, you're like, uh the iron the irony is like palpable. But yeah, I mean that's that's why you have to induce some sort of some some sense of, of emotional feeling and compatibility with the state of Israel. Like, I mean, there's so many examples through our history of Jews being persecuted in their historical homelands, you know, after they were exiled from Israel, you know. The you know the Farhud and in, in uh, you know we, we saw in the Middle East like like very recently we're celebrating the anniversary of that and yeah. the Yemeni Jews and the other and the the other Maghrebi Jews and all the stuff that they faced and people don't know about it but I guess you know if there's a way to induce some sort of emotional reaction towards that like you know all these Jews you know they were they were persecuted they were forced out of their homes you can count on one hand the number of Jews still living in some of these Arab countries and I think that I think that that turning that switch in these people's minds is really the only way for us to move forward because you're right like a logical explanation is not going to do do this justice people don't really care and there has to be some sort of sense of people's heartstrings have to be tugged in order for them to move forward in a positive direction in this way and so but, yeah okay go go on you know if you finish your thought i want to yeah but like, like i think you know ultimately like that requires a, a a change in strategy on the part of our institutions which i think have been really reluctant to to kind of dig into that very emotional good. way of thinking. Good. So so I I, I want to do a little recap. Uh, you know, for, yeah. for, for, for anyone who's who's listening uh, thus far. So um, we have this big have this big changes happening in society. Things that have started a long time ago, fueled by many different uh, forces. They're already well underway. It, it's happening. We probably can't stop those changes from happening. Is, you know, head on. You can't. You can't just t turn it on a dial. It, it has to be, again, a gradual rebuild of something, and it's going to be a, a bigger sort of fight, let's say, or a bigger. You know, it's a it's a bigger event. Within that, you have us. You have Jewish people uh, who have been predominantly in Israel and in the U.S. Uh, trying to figure out where they are, where where they belong, and um, in, in an attempt to kind of take the the political diplomatic route we're trying to just do the best they can to just uh, make friends with these this camp not anger this camp right do do this the, this diplomatic sort of dance um in the hope that it will it will let them keep what they have not lose ground and and stay in you know stay in in the, in the political game uh and you have uh, you have uh, leadership uh, in general, that's not really showing signs of changing any of its um, uh, approach, any of its strategies on, on you know, on, for, you know, on dealing with 
anti-Semitism, with, with wokeness, with, uh, with anti-Zionism. They say they want to change things, but I know I've been to conferences here in Israel uh, listening to the beautiful words that they're saying, but then when you come in, you say, hey, I have, I have an idea for, for uh, you, know, some, you know, a satirical platform for young Jews that will get them to, like, oh, no, 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 we need someone to, you know, champion or say why, why Israel is making good startups. Like, oh, that's not changing anything, you know? <laughs> the cherry tomato idea. Yeah, yeah, cherry tomatoes. Exactly. Oh, they're cherry tomatoes. Exactly. So, so, <laughs> so, so we we kind of like in a, in a bind in a way. It's almost like and and we as as we said, we see you know from history that usually these big changes that happen in in, in the the most developed countries in the world, they don't end well for Jews. Uh, I don't want to ask you if you think that uh, America might expel the Jews or Jews might lose certain freedoms in America. I see you're kind of shaking your head because it's inconceivable, but you know it was inconceivable in Germany, it was inconceivable in Spain, it was inconceivable everywhere else. The point is not that. The point is really what uh, we're trying to kind of zero in on. Like, where is uh, me? I'm listening to this podcast now. I'm 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 a guy in college. Where is my? What, what can I do? How can I regain some control? I see, I also feel, by the way, I feel, and let's talk about that. I feel like these people uh, are facing me. They're motivated by some higher, some very powerful sentiment that I don't currently possess. Like I'm almost like not even certain that that I, I need, that I need to be standing uh, up for for this uh, these ideas, these ideals, is you know Israel, Israel, and the Jewish. Be- like maybe I could just shake that off and just maybe even join their ranks because they seem to be having a good time, you know. Yeah. So how do you know, this is a very, very uh, scary, very uncertain environment for for young Jewish people. Where yeah. let's let's try to find together the, where, where's the place that we can actually control? What can we actually do in your mind? Well, we need I think you said it, you said it best when you said like, you know, oh, it seems like the party's happening over there on their side. I might as well join it. Like we need to find our, our raison d'etre. We need to find we need to find kind of what what brings us together, what makes us relevant in this world, and how we can use that and channel that energy into a force for good. The fact is that I, I that you know going back to a comment I made much earlier is that you know the, the social incentives for for being pro-Israel or anti-Israel they're 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 significantly misbalanced. And the fact is that if you join the anti-Israel cause on college campuses you'll be met with a bevy of social benefits, including, you know, many communities of people who are somehow drawn to it, or they feel like they're, you know, this is their way of championing social justice. Like there are so many reasons for people to do this. And we need to find a way to, to have some sort of clear cut motivation on our side. You know, we have a lot to celebrate. We've been through a lot as a people. We now have our own state in our, in our ancestral homeland. You know, there's still a lot of us at this point in America despite our population kind of flatlining, but we have a lot to celebrate and we need, a, we, we need to kind of reorient ourselves towards, towards our innermost desires for the world and the values that bring us together. And ultimately what that means is that we have to put our minds together and find some specific way to motivate young Jews to stick with us and to be proud of what they have to bring, but not in such a way as to diminish others. Proud of what they have to bring because they see it as a force for good in the world and a way to make a positive impact throughout their lives. And I don't know exactly what the answer is yet, but I think it's important for us to put our minds towards that and recognize that there is a deep psychological analysis that needs to be had of like why young Jews are not gravitating towards our cause, because a lot of it does have to do with the social benefits that are derived from being aligned with the anti-Israel cause. As long as there is some sort of community, as long as there's something, you know, there's some oomph there for us, like there are, people will gravitate, you know, large, large objects, they gravitate, you know, the, they have some sort of gravitational pull and we need to, we need to collect ourselves in such a way as to get more people to join our cause. So this is great, Jared. I think you, you just nailed it on, on the head. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, so yeah, Seth, I mean, we, maybe we have, uh, we have some ideas we can share. I, with you. Yeah. I'd like, yeah, yeah. um, yeah. like to, to open that up more, but to summarize there, uh, we need to have a compelling future, not just running from the stick, yeah. right? There needs to be something very, very compelling for us and worthwhile. And also, uh, you mentioned everyone else, that it, it benefits everyone. It's not at the exclusion of anyone or against anyone. I don't remember how, how you said it, but that it's, it's to benefit everyone. I think this, is, this should be the zero point 
but we don't we don't even i mean it's maybe it's worth it to, to talk about history a little bit more but just so we understand where we are but that has to be the zero point we all need to be focusing on what is our good compelling future i mean i mean again we, you don't have to have the answer yourself i i think you know seth and i we we, we did a lot of research into we looked into our um, this is where we so the patterns we looked into history to find the patterns and the you know the, our place in the network we looked for network science but that essence the purpose those values that you talked about at the very beginning um when you look at, uh, at our, our own jewish sages you find all of it there and the values do not revolve around you know that shall have the biggest startup you know or you know that they shall exit at the age of 27 that that's not that's not what they talk what they're talking about they're talking about something much deeper actually not 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 morals but something much much deeper that has to do with the way people relate to one another and to our our place in it yeah. so i wonder if this is something that you were thinking as well and and uh Maybe I can ask you specifically. You, you, you're in Israel now. Yeah. Uh, I ma- this is not your first time in Israel, I imagine, right? No, I, I've been here a few times before. What, what, tell me, maybe for, for people, especially those who are, have not been here, or maybe there's some Jews who have forgotten or haven't been here, haven't done their birthright or whatever. But like, w- there's a lot of um, bad things happening in Israel, <laughs> a lot of things to criticize about the Israeli person on the street. <laughs> However, there are things, um, there are good things about him that you won't find anywhere else in the world. Maybe there's something you can point to that can that can that can make make us imagine, uh, you know, the kind of Israeli nation that I would be proud to be a part of, right? Yeah. Not the not the ones that everybody is kind of pointing their fingers at and and criticizing and. You know, maybe deep down I feel like, uh, yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe they're... no, something that I can be certain that this is something that I can bring to the world. What what did you find? Yeah, so you know, there there are some qualities that are apparent from the minute you step off the plane at Ben Gurion, which is a you know, for instance, you know, Israelis tend to be rough around the edges. You know, Israelis tend to tend to be pushy and maybe a little bit rude sometimes, or or a little bit kind of out there. You know, these are just qualities that that um, you know are brought to the table because you know this is a society that lives in a very perilous area of the world where they're constantly being barraged with terrorism and, and rockets and uh, and whole international ecosystem that's fighting against them. But there are many, many really wonderful qualities that sit at the core of Israeli life. Um, I think the first of them, and perhaps even the most important, is that there is a real zest for life here. You can tell that people, you can tell that so many people who live here really, really love it here. They feel a sense of connection, as if there is a part of them. You know, especially for people who made Aliyah. For Olim, who came here from other countries in the diaspora, but there's there's a part of them that 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 was tugging at them, and that that brought them all the way here, and they felt like they could kind of find their way and return to this sense of community that they felt like they had been lacking in their pre in their previous countries, and that brings so many people to Israel. Um, there's a there's a there's a tremendous resiliency here, you know. People have weathered so much hardship. Um, People, you know, we're only talking about like two generations out from the Holocaust. Like the Holocaust didn't happen that long ago. You know, the Holocaust is, is still sits within the collective memory of people in Israel. And yet there is such a positive quality that, you know, that pushes people forward and that causes them to really embrace life and embrace their livelihoods here in Israel. And it's something that we don't really see in many other countries around the world. But all, and, and then, you know, I think another thing to consider, too, is that, you know, Israel is a bastion of Western values. You know, Israel is truly a place where the East and the West intermingle. It's a place that borrows so much culturally from, from Sephardi culture and Mizrahi culture, um, but also from also from the West. I mean, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition, classical liberal values, enlightenment principles, these are all things that you can find here. And so I think that all those things together creates a really, really wonderful blossoming society where people feel like they have some sort of innate purpose, right? Like they aren't they aren't just adrift, they aren't just wandering you know, aimlessly through life, trying to find their, you know, trying to find their way and feeling like they're lonely and confused. Like, you know, I think Israel more than, more than almost any other country, um, it, it's a place where people really feel this, this an innate sense of purpose. And like, they're here for a reason. And you can tell when you go to some sort of mini on Friday night, you, get, you can tell by walking on the beach in Tel Aviv, the whole way in which Israeli society functions is based on a common love 
and the mutual adoration for the Jewish people and for living in harmony with other people who come from a similar heritage, but you know, who are also scattered from across the world. And Israel has a very unique way, you know, well, so, so, so mutual, mutual love. So this yeah. is something that's palpable. I mean, that, that's the most Absolutely. interesting thing of all the things you said so far. Yeah. There's a there's a mutual love for, you know, pe you know, I see people on the train every day, you know, there are Haredi people on the train and there are also people, you know, who are who are a religious, but they're 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 bound by this mutual love of what it means to be Jewish and to live in the world as it is today. And it's very rare to see in other countries. So Haredim and so so religious people and secular people together with this love is like very much this picture of right and left, of opposites who share some common bigger goal. Um, it seems to me that we as a Jewish people with all of the different, um, you, know, you have like one of every shape and size in the Jewish people. Maybe this is something that, you know, on college campuses, you, you, you show that, you know, because we also, I think we're, we're just seen as like the, you know, male, white male kind of thing. And, yeah. You know, right. As that's what the Jews <laughs> are. But I, we, to us, it's ridiculous because we understand who the people, who the Jewish right. people are, but maybe to bring together a lot of different kinds of Jews um, or Jews and try and make a micro micro meaning like on campus or some somehow to to show there that this one's from the right this one's the left this one's religious this one's this but we all sit together on Friday night you know we all yeah. find something that we that's more important to us than our differences absolutely and I mean that's 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 the ideal situation it's one that I I I hope can come about. The problem is, is that, you know, especially at these college campuses, you know, this happened at Princeton for me, but it happens all over the country is that you, you, you don't see that. There's, even with like BDS, you know, one of the issues that I faced being somebody who kind of pulled from all these different sides of things is that there was very little um, interaction and dialogue between different sects of the Jewish community. You know, more religious Jews and more secular Jews, it was hard to bring people together, you know, and sit at them at the same table and to talk. Jews from the right. Well, that's why I called you out when you said that there's this love between between them because I, I Well, I think I think there's a potential for for love. I think that is unrealized. Yeah, I, I think I think like like in listen, Israel of course there there are many sectional um issues that we face, but there is there is a common passion that unites Jews from all these different backgrounds. And I agree with you that it's kind of unrealized in the US. Israel of course, you know, Israel also in, has, Israel also issues, in Israel. Like, it's in a better state in Israel I think than in the US generally speaking. Slightly, yeah, you're right. But I mean, we we're just on board, you know, on, on a threshold of civil war for, for, for a moment. So, you know. Yeah, listen, of course, there like there are issues there, but I, but generally I think you see more, <laughs> more interaction. In <laughs> are you an optimist or a pessimist, Jared? Um I don't I don't like to find myself with those terms. I try to be a re I try to be a realist. Um, you know, certainly I think that there are some camps who are totally nihilistic about this especially on the right, you know, who say, oh, you know, there's no hope. Okay, well, that's not a way for us to move forward. Yeah, there, there's, no, there's nothing to do about that. Like, are you just going to sit there and complain? Like, you know, come on, we have agency in this, like, get up on your feet, do something about it. And then there are, there are those on the left, you know, a lot of people live in la la land. And they're frankly delusional about kind of the state of, of what things are in. And, and they're just preaching, you know, woke stuff in DEI. And, and like, that's not that's not, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying to trivialize it, but like that stuff is not going to help out our cause. I think that there's a middle way that's, that's realistic and, and it recognizes that, yeah, we're facing a lot of the issues, but there's also a future that we need to forge and we can't just abandon everything because it's convenient for us to do so. Uh, you know, uh, our, our sages said that uh, any calamity that comes to the world comes for, for Israel. And then uh, Rav Cook says that uh, it's time now that everyone will come to know that the salvation of Israel and salvation of the world uh, depends only on the appearance of the concealed light of the internality of the Torah. And the internality of the Torah speaks of only one thing, which is love your friend as yourself. This is that, that inner rule of the Torah, which we conveniently push aside, you know, when we have like, uh, you know, we forget about it. It's like, uh, well, this is the number one rule. Rabbi Akiva said it's the one rule. Yeah, yeah, but let's do other rules before that, you know. 
can I quickly plug my my blog where I write about this? Yes, yes, absolutely. Plug it away. Like, you know, like, okay, so um, my blog is uh, jaredstone.substack.com. My writings are, you know, a lot of people like them. A lot of people think that they're kind of provocative because they speak to some of these theses, but I would love for you guys, you know, in the audience to read them and comment. Let me know what you think. I just want to start a conversation. Like these things that we talked about are super important and obviously keep listening to the podcast, but I think it's important that we all kind of channel our collective efforts and and, and put forward a vision and, and think intuitively and on our feet. And that's what we got to do. Nice. So, yeah, I, so I you know, I, I hope, um, I, I, we're, you know, we're, we're drawing to a close and I, I, I wanted you to maybe end because of how you presented everything and the situation and yourself. Uh, and we, we, we kind of talked about that, that new image for the Jew. And we also, we usually ask people on the show, if an alien came, how would you define a Jew to that, to the alien? So mm. how would you define a Jew? Make it the best definition that you can. Maybe it's not the definition, the prevailing definition right now, but maybe if they make a new dictionary, you know, in the next, uh, you know, 10 years from now, what would be under the picture if there was a picture or under, at least under the value of Jew, right? What would that be? Give us the best kind of, let's imagine together. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to paint this with, you know, with, with, uh, with broad strokes here. But I think that in many ways, like we're, we're we're kind of the vehicle for human civilization that moves it forward. And I know that I sound, you know, I'm not trying to sound like, you know, dismissive of other ideologies or whatever, but like we, we've been there and we've, we, we've, we've seen, you know, the, the tremendous social and cultural and religious and political challenges that, are, that have faced human civilization for thousands of years. And we've somehow, we've somehow, you know, put our minds together and we, and we have conveyed humankind forward in such a way as to, you know, move us in a positive direction while also, I think, hearkening back to the traditions that have been meaningful and positive for us. And I think that at this point, you know, we need to remain kind of a, a vehicle for moving civilization forward. I think that these forces that we're talking about, you know, DEI, wokeism, blah, 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 like, like these, are, these are clear hindrances that are trying to hold us back. They're regressive, which is ironic because they're 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 colloquially seen as progressive ideologies, but they're actually regressive in the way that they're trying to stunt our ability for for growth and human uh, for growth and innovation as uh, the human race. But we as Jews need to be the people who carry our history with us, and you know are kind of like a capsule of all that preceded us. Um, but we need to move forward, and we need to drive our civilization forward. We need to look towards the future and recognize that there is a future for all of us and especially for the Jewish people. And we need to be proactive. We need to work with intent and with a, a common love for the Jewish people and for humanity at large. And we just need to move civilization forward. And so there's no reason for us to stick our heads in the sand. Let's not lie about what we're currently facing. Let's also not be totally nihilistic about it. You know, let's 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 move us forward. There's a future for all of us. And I think that's what we're here to do. Send them a jersey. He's on the team. All right. Where do we vote for you? Where, where do we? Uh... <laughs> All right. Oh, Jared, yeah. thank you so much. Uh... Thank you for me. The most important thing, though, is that our future is not done yet. We don't know what it's going to be. And even though, like you said, we've been through this for a couple thousand years and we have a lot of experience under our belts, the future we have to make together specifically all of us have to find that compelling future together from this mix of all of us and that's why it's so exciting and that's why it's um, heartwarming to hear you speak as a leader in the younger generation who already starts to see this and understand this yeah, so uh this is it everyone this is the jewel function uh like comment share get in the conversation and uh we have to find our function together. There's just no other way. So um, we'll see you all on our next talk. Thank you, Jared, Seth. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys.